Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I want to go over a video that's dealing with Mark Levin interviewing so well. I thought it was pronounced so well. Sowell, I think he, I think Levine pronounces it. But Thomas Sowell, and uh, also a video that's it's interesting. It's, it's from Good Kid Productions, which is a documentary, um, kind of indie documentary about Harvard and how they were pushing or trying to defame a prestigious black scholar that was going against some of the things that Claudine gave was promoting so let's begin with with the video with mark levin interviewing thomas solo america we're here with dr thomas soul the book is social justice fallacies i want to encourage you to go to amazon.com and grab a copy any major bookstore should have a copy and it is very readable, and it is worth reading, particularly now during these times. Dr. Saul, um, when we talk about equality, immediately race pops into mind. Uh, it's always about race, racial discrimination, about the founding of the nation, white dominant society, so forth and so on. And you make the case, and you've made this case throughout your life, and it's very poignant in your book, which is, wait a minute. Of course, this has some impact, but it's not the only thing that has an impact. But why, what, first of all, what other things have an impact? It's probably an infinite list of things. And secondly, why do they only focus on race on the left? I, I guess it's because of that, that's proven both to be a politically uh, a popular thing to do. Uh, but in point of fact, uh, one, of, one of the things that's mentioned in the book is a, a study that was done by the New York Times of all people all, the, all some years ago, uh, where they tried to, to uh, show the 10 poorest counties in the United States. Uh, and they mentioned which ones they were and so on. Uh, uh, and and uh, it turns out that six of those 10 counties had a popula the population that was from 90% to 100% white. Now, in the New York Times, they didn't mention the race of the people, but once they told me the counties, I looked it up, and in fact, I followed the average income in those six counties over a span of 50 years, and in all those 50 years, all six of those counties had a median income lower than the median income of Black Americans. Now, and so those the people in those counties uh, faced zero racism, because they were white and indistinguishable from all, from all other whites. Uh, they, they didn't have a legacy of slavery, and yet there, there they were. Uh, and and it, 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 you have to ask them, clearly there must be other things that cause poverty. We can't just assume that because people of a given race have uh, more poverty than some other, other, other people, that race must be the reason. But this has become the automatic kind of thing. And I think most people would be uh, quite surprised. One of the things that, that happens is that behavior matters. And, and, and you see that in so many uh, uh, different ways. Uh, for, for, for example, uh, I, think, I think most people would be surprised to learn that despite the fact that blacks as a whole have a higher poverty rate than whites as a whole, black married couple families have a have for more than a quarter of a century, every single year, at a poverty rate under 10%. Uh, and in most of those years, the national poverty rate was not as low as 10%. So it, it, it's not a quite, and I can say, well, this is due to institutional racism. In that case, does that mean that the racists make an exception for blacks who are married? I mean, the racists either know or care whether blacks are married. None of these glib uh, explanations stands up to the slightest empirical study. And let's talk about this when it comes to minorities. 
generally. You have an Asian population in this country that achieves a lot as a group, intellectually, education-wise, and um, they are discriminated against by these Ivy League colleges, by Harvard, we just had a Supreme Court decision and so forth, the way Jews were 100 years earlier, by Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and so forth. So the people who push this race issue, is it that they really care about black people or Asian people or Jewish people, or is it that it's just another wedge issue to try and destroy this culture and destroy this society? There are some people who are, who are, who are both. Some really believe it, and I, I feel sorry for them. But there are some, some who really don't care. If, if it gets them elected, that's what matters. And this is one of the tragedies of trying to uh, politicize race. Uh, there, there are so many fallacies that it's hard to even know which, which one to, to, to take up. But, uh, for example, the, the, the great narrative is that Blacks uh, rose from poverty, uh, got into uh, uh, professional occupations as a result of the 1960s social welfare programs. Uh, and that and this has been a bit, big benefit. Uh, one of the problems with this way of looking at things is that everything depends on when you pick as the start of this trend. Uh, if you go back to 1940, that is 20 years before these wonderful things are supposed to have happened in the 1960s, and you discover that the uh, degree of which blacks were in poverty declined from 87% in 1940 to 47% in 1960. So it went, by, went down by 40 points uh, in those 20 years. Now you look at the 20 years following 1960, they went down 18 points. And so the, the, the trend did not begin in the 1960s. The trend was there before that. And the trend did not even accelerate after 1960. Many people think that it would all began with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, that's a, that was a fine act to, to, to get rid of the segregation laws in the South. But the cold fact is that the percentage of blacks who had professional occupations doubled from 1954 to 1964. That is in, in the decade ending at the time that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. If you look at things that are negative, like for example, uh, uh, black children being raised in single parent households. In 1940, just under 17% of black kids uh, were raised in, parent, in one parent families. But at the, after the 1960s, before the end of the century, four times that many, 68% of black kids were being raised in one parent families. And that does not depend on racism or any of the other things they talk about. It depends upon things that happened due to the policies of the 1960s, which are still going forward. Which encourage the dissolution of the family. It's just unbelievable. Dr. So when we return, my big question for you is, is it Nick? So that's the, basically the end of the, the clip that I have. But the main point I'm making here is just that there are serious researchers, so well, or so well, <laughs> I always pronounced it so well, um, Dr. So well and Dr. Fry, they are prominent black researchers. I believe Sowell is a sociologist while Fry is an economist, but maybe both of our are economists. But the, the, the main point here is that you have serious researchers that are saying that DEI and affirmative action and this race card is a fallacy. There is racism that does take place but it's nowhere as structural as Claudine Gay and her crowd is saying. And it just so happens that Sowell and Fry are black. So there's a bigger story here with DEI and affirmative action. And it, remember what I said about the DEI is about destroying family, country, right? And, and God. Well, like Dr. Sowell said, when you start instituting these affirmative action policies, C 
single parent households increased before relative to before so it's really this issue of when the when the child what their probabilities are for success are they going down the right path of success if they you know are they are do they have the right support at the family at, at, at the family unit do they have the right moral foundation in terms of religion and morality in do they have a do they have a strong sense of country and duty these three elements that i'm talking about family god and country are really really important to embedding a certain probability an increased probability of later success and if you are at the right place at the right time with the right skill sets you will climb up the ladder independent of your skin but when you start moving people and having them jump across the line having them skip the steps having them put into positions that they're not qualified for it doesn't make the society better and it actually creates more division because people see it see that there's a fallacy there there's a problem with that kind of policy so you got to get back to the root cause it's a socioeconomic it's not a racial cause and that's why i'm doing this video now i'm going to do the kid production the good kid production which is a documentary and it's titled how Claudine Gay canceled Harvard's best black professor. It's a mini documentary. It's a very good documentary and I will pause through it to, to give you my take on it. But Harvard went after an individual that was questioning the system. And when you question the system, you're rocking the boat and you're hurting people that created their empire, AKA Claudine Gay. And you are disrupting a social governmental program of control, divide and control. Again, DEI, CRT, is about weakening the family unit, about weakening God and weakening country. Now, before I start, please subscribe to all my channels. I have six channels. I'm heavily censored on YouTube when I talk about issues that are related to pathogens. <laughs> I mean, and so please subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube, and I have uh, Brighton, BitChute, and Rumble. I also have Patreon. Please subscribe to my Patreon account to help support my news coverage. Be a paid subscriber for my channel on Patreon. Please donate on my website, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Link is in the description of this video and all my videos. Click the, the website link. Go to the homepage and the very bottom, you can donate through Stripe or PayPal, or you can donate through Buy Me a Coffee. That will help to support my news coverage. I, all the news that I cover, I give for free. I don't put anything behind a paywall. So, so you get news, all right? Please help support my work by subscribing, by sharing, and asking your network to follow me. Every time I publish on YouTube, on my big channel, I get uns individuals that are unsubscribed. And this has been happening for four years at a, a steady clip, all right? And it's not because of what I'm saying and the people don't like it. It's because YouTube doesn't like it. I am not the only one this is happening to. There are many YouTubers that this is happening to that are like marked 
that if they have a big channel. Please help support my work by subscribing to the channels and making sure that your network subscribes to the channels. That way we circumvent the censorship. Welcome to Harvard, the platinum brand, the high temple of learning. A most unlikely man once made it through these gates. A man abandoned by his mom at birth, who watched his family disappear into the drug trade, and his best friends go to prison for armed robbery. This unwanted son escaped and through pure intellectual virtuosity, pulled himself to here. That man is Roland Fryer, and once he got here, he did exactly what this place claims to do, inquire along the frontier of intellectual discovery. Roland asked maximally provocative questions about racism, schools, policing, and he made some discoveries. These discoveries were treasonous, exploding the political pieties that saturate this place, and Harvard destroyed him for it. I love this guy. What's happening to him is a freaking travesty. This, because this is um, so I'm very passionate about. It. This is this is the most cold-blooded murder I've ever seen. Do you want to know what happened behind these cathedral walls? Do you want to know what happened to Roland Fire? Roland introduced himself to me by coming up to me at this conference after I had made a presentation and saying, you know, I want to work with you. To which my response was, well, man, a lot of people want to work with me. Who are you? <laughs> okay. We became friends. I mean, he was almost like an adopted son. One of his early papers that I thought was really extraordinary was this uh, paper on economics of acting white. This is the controversial theory that many black kids consider doing well in school to be a white thing, and that kids who excel in school will get labeled race traitors and lose friends. There's a party line on the acting white uh, slander, they call it, which is that it's complete bullshit. Mounds of existing research seemed to debunk acting white by simply asking top students how popular they were and finding no social penalty for doing well in school. Asking a 13-year-old boy how popular is, it's like asking him how much sex he's having. I mean, you're going to get an answer. It's probably not going to be the right one. Roland comes up with a different way to measure popularity. The students are asked, who are your three best friends? And so you can count how many times somebody gets named as somebody else's three best friends. He has this beautiful algorithm for constructing a popularity index, which he then correlates with the student's grades. And he finds that the curve of popularity rises up until about a B, and then it starts to tail off. Roland finds that black kids do lose friends as they excel in school, that there's a cultural ceiling capping classroom performance. A lot of times we don't talk honestly and openly about the things that now are think, Now think about that, all right? The school system, all right, and the pressures in the society are such that achieving blacks, blacks that achieve academically, scholastically, are viewed in a negative light. So there's a negative feedback clue. If you're doing well, and, but you want to keep friends and friends are more important to you in the parlance of economics, you have a higher utility for friends versus academic performance. That negative feedback loop will lead you to not perform as well in academia because you want friends. Now, if you view academia as more important than friends, then those students most likely will continue to excel, all right? 
But the key here is, is that there is social pressure to not do so well. All right. Now, there are many variables for that. But one of those variables is not just peer pressure. But it's also you're starting to hear it in performance. And it'll come, it'll come out in this video, too. The performance of the teachers. It's not just the student. And so because of the strong lobbying group, the strong labor union power of the teachers union, you, it's hard for them to reform and have higher standards. And that unperforming teachers should be kicked out, but the union protects them. And so therefore there's another force vector that helps with this decline. Keep the poor, te the bad teachers in these school systems. You have the negative, you know, this negative feedback, this negative feedback with, with students and then you, you know, with the peers, and you have a society where that group of people aren't doing as well relative to other peers. And when that happens, then the school system will say, we need more money. We need more money. We need more money. We need more money. We need more teachers. We need more. See, it's, it's a never ending pigs at the trough. We need to hold these teachers accountable. We also have to increase the standards of these students that are in high school and in, in elementary schools. And by doing that, you're going to end up having a better product for a citizen. You'll have a, a more productive citizen. You'll have a citizen that has if you mean, if you focus on the God, the country, and the family concept, then you're going to have a more moral society. You're going to have a stronger society. Blacks in America. And that's, that's what I'm all about, frankly. These things can be studied scientifically, and we have to do so to make progress. <laughs> Roland is originally from Daytona Beach, Florida. Right after he's born, his mother flees the state. He won't meet her until he's 20. He's raised by his dad, a gambling addicted alcoholic. Roland learns to drive stick shift, picking him up from jail. In high school, Roland falls into small time crime, stealing clothes from department stores, and selling off the loot from his bedroom. A 357 Magnum sitting on his lap. He's recruited to college on an athletic scholarship and happens to drop in on an economics class. He's instantly mesmerized by the data sets of clean equations. Eventually, he studies under Steve Levitt, the Freakonomics phenom. He learns the craft, how to deploy these tools to crack open the world and reveal hidden truths. And the truth that matters most to Roland is how to fix schools for all the other young Rolands in the world. It wasn't until I got involved in education I heard about the cardiac test. He'd walk around the school and he, they would say, we have a new program, after school program. I said, oh, that's great. Does it work? And they would say, yeah. I said, well, how do you know it works? You can feel it in your heart. <laughs> now, now, he's an economist, but he's applying principles that are in, in MBA, in, in business school. And that is set a goal and you monitor to see how you're performing relative to the goal. And here's the problem with education is that there's not enough accountability. There's not enough monitoring to see if programs are working. And so they keep on throwing money and more money and more money. I think that Dr. Fryer is right on the money. He's correct in his ideas 
to how to fix the inner cities in terms of education. It's not a black and white issue. It's about giving children a chance at the very beginning to become the best that they can be. Because if you take someone that is that it, that it can excel, all right, or um, someone that has aptitude for a certain subject, and you instill that encouragement and 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 drive to learn more, then they're most likely going to be able to get to college and be successful in that discipline. But if you take that same person and you don't and you you know you teach them to to the lowest common denominator in the class or if you don't encourage this this individual most likely they'll go down a path that is not as successful so it's about those early days the early days and this is why it's so important to understand the social dynamics and the educational dynamics during the the 2020 crisis and in the post crisis, pathogenic crisis that we went through, children aren't learning as well as they used to. They're having speech impediments. Their, their, their grade reading level is, is you know one or two, maybe even more grades lower. We have a whole society and it's not just black. So just this, is, this was done pre, I believe this was published pre I don't know when this was published. Oh, it was one year ago. So it was published one year ago. But you know, the point here is, is this, that, that there is a dynamic. And his solution to solve the problem in the post crisis that we went through for children of all ethnicities is the same solution that he came up with for the inner city black constituency. But Claudine Gay went after him because he rocked the boat. <laughs> you know what the deal? Roland's work brings him here to the Harlem Children's Zone. It's a revolution, taking in poor black kids and within three years getting them to catch up to and even exceed their white peers at richer schools. You know, we really got to think about this gap here because there's like a white black gap going on. I'm not sure why you guys didn't actually achieve. He starts piecing together a five part formula for the zone's success. And he finds that a central piece is aggressive human capital management. Economists speak for the practice of firing tons of teachers. Mm -hmm. You ask the teachers, what do you think you need to educate these kids? And we got answers like, well, all we need is smarter kids. I said, all you need is a new job. Is those formula. <clears throat> this is the reason why there's such a pushback. Because the teachers' union is so strong that they don't want to hear that they're failing the students. And so it's, they'll promote the CRT and the DEI stuff, the teachers, because they want to they want to shift blame onto the students. And where the blame really is, it's on the teachers and on the, the, the this destruction of the family unit, the loss of God and, and country. Once you strengthen those, you're going to have a very prosperous society for all its citizens that want to be prosperous. And I think that most children, if you give them encouragement at the very early stages, they will want to be that. But it's the teachers. And then you bring in the whole wokeism and the transgender and the, you know, and the, you know, the, the drag queens and all this stuff. And it confuses the kids and it causes disruption in their learning. And they want to create the division. They want to promote the CRT and they want to promote this DEI. They want to destroy the family. They want to destroy 
God and country. But his solution is right. And it's, it's business. This is part of the reason why people are, are, are uh, trying to get their kids into good boarding schools, right? And private schools. Because they know the inner city sucks. The inner city schools, the, pri the public schools suck. Because they're run by an agenda. Now, unfortunately, some of these private schools have been infiltrated by this whole DEI stuff, too. But the standards are still very high there. It's, it, they are telling the students, you have to perform. And when you set high standards for kids, they usually will do okay. Now, there may be some that falter and that may need extra attention, but you can pick them up if you catch it early. is simply operationalized common sense. Revolutionizing schools won't require a revolution. They needed extra time. If you're behind, you either got to spend more time or ask the white kids to please take Thursday and Friday off. Small tutoring groups, they use data to drive instruction. They had high expectations. They took no excuses with them. The highlight of Roland's youth were summer spent with his grandmother, a Florida grade school teacher, and she notices what he notices about this formula. I talk to my grandmother about every other day. She lives in Daytona Beach, Florida, very closely. And I told her the five things. And we're family now. I'll just tell you what she told me. She said, baby, they pay you for that shit. <laughs> I know about this. But if it's so obvious, why we're not doing it? Roland wins a MacArthur Genius Prize. He's a Time 100 honoree. Roland Breyer! <laughs> celebrated on national news. These are kids that a lot of people have given up on. His success showed that it's never too late. Roland, the unwanted son, becomes the first African-American to ever win the Clark Medal, the prize for the top young economist in the world. And Roland arrives at this mythic place. Now, you know, here's the thing that's sad that will probably never happen for him, but he was on the path you know, with more research to be published and, you know, more books to be written and all this stuff. But he was on the path to get a Nobel Prize. All right. He was on that track. He was a little too young for it, but he was on that track to be of that caliber. And Claudine Gay destroyed that. So when she keeps on whining that there's all these people that are going after her, you know, the reality of the situation is, is that she is part of a group that's trying to destroy our country. Harvard makes him a professor right here in the economics department. He was not... Uh a domesticated Negro, <laughs> okay? He uh, walked around with his head held high and he didn't tolerate fools gladly. One day in 2012, Roland found such a fool at a forum hosted by Harvard. And the day's fool was David Simon, the creator of The Wire. Simon traffics in a condescending nihilism. A skepticism that Roland's school reform work could ever make a difference. You can have the best school system in the world. They're not going to believe that it matters. You can't knock down that, 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 that terrorizing fear that you just don't matter, that you have your self-worth. It's, it's horrible. How do we do that? We've never tried. He didn't make the white people feel comfortable in their soft racism, their soft liberal racism. How would we know? He didn't dance for them. I've been in fifth grade classrooms in which they're still learning the clock and how to tell time in fifth grade. I told the principal, if they can't tell time at this point, they'll have no place to be on time for. 
Roland does quantitative social science. He doesn't dance. What I do know is that if you look at kids in 2005 who lost the lottery and going to the Harlem Children's Zone, the ones who lost the lottery are six times more likely to be pregnant in their teens. Ten of them are dead or in prison. But if you're in that school, you're not. And when he finds some nonsense, he called it nonsense. Let's get past the bullshit because we can actually get this stuff done. It's not what to do. The question is, do we have the courage to do it? Roland's work represents a mortal threat to some of the most powerful black people at Harvard. Consider Claudine Gay, the daughter of an engineer who went from Exeter directly to Stanford and to Harvard. She's a silky smooth corporate operator. Her signature accomplishment is a Harvard-wide inequality initiative. The world is awake to inequality and systemic racism and anti-black racism and virtual. I remember and seeing this initiative while I was doing my master's at Harvard University. So I'm, I'm familiar with this. I never before. It's a standard array of task forces, symposiums, buzzwords promising equity and inclusion. Uh, a way of bringing this all together into a, into an agenda that feels um, complementary and synergistic. A way to bring us all together into an agenda that feels complementary and synergistic. Bring us into an agenda. <laughs> it's right there. It's right there in what she just said. Or take Larry Bobo, a man who regularly attacks Roland's work in his classroom. Bobo is the product of privilege, born to a physician in a cozy suburb of Nashville. A longtime professor of African American studies, Bobo has reached the coveted apex of his profession by doing this. Racism, racism, you see, racism of racism, the terrible wound of slavery and attempted racism. This is the soft porn of black pain an empty, endless recitation of victimhood that gives ample moral pleasure to the audience that actually accomplishes nothing for the kids Roland cares about. He's not into the menstrual show. He's more likely to tell you something like, you don't know a damn thing about what black people's problems are. And he's more likely to say that not only to you if you're white, but if you're one of these bow tie wearing domesticated Negroes who's never seen the inside of a housing project, he might tell you a little bit of something about that. He might tell you, you don't know what a crack house is. You ain't never been anywhere near where there's gunfire uh, crying out at two o'clock in the morning. You don't know where it came from. That's what he's likely to say. They don't like those kind of people at Harvard, I've noticed. <laughs> And then Roland asked the question at the molten hot center of American politics, are racist police murdering black people? He had a team of his research confederates go down there and read through the handwritten police incident reports. And you know the race of the subject, you know where the gunshots have been fired. He was particularly interested in the use of uh, lethal force. When would the police kill a suspect? Oh boy. Uh... I remember Roland walking in and saying, what do the numbers look like? And I said, I just don't want to say it out loud. And he said, what do you mean you don't want to say it out loud? I gave this paper early on, three professors took me to the side, saying, I mean, it's so different, though. It's so different. You don't want to post. You, you put that away. I said, well, you just guaranteed I'm going to put it in the matter. The reason being is that he was proving that their agenda is a lie. That's the importance of this video that I'm doing. Claudine Gay's 
agenda, DEI and CRT agenda is a lie. Find bias in lethal use of force. In fact, he found that it was less likely that force would be used against the suspect when the suspect was black. The resulting media firestorm prompts credible death threats and Roland is temporarily assigned around-the-clock police protection. I think the truth, truth helps us, right? False narratives do not. I find it um, frustrating. I find it insulting that people would change the truth because they think they're trying to help us. They're just trying to help themselves. The truth is enough. Just like... Sharpton, Al Sharpton, and people like him, Jesse Jackson. There are a group of people that are promoting this. Whitey is bad. Males are bad. Jews are bad. Mentality. And it's coming right out of this CRT crap. I'm just following the data where I'm What are you doing? What is he trying to help himself? The truth is enough. I'm just following the data where I'm What are you doing? Uh, I like him. How, how is he still at Harvard? It's complicated. <laughs> it's actually, it's complicated. Oh boy. I want to do what I can to support it. I am not I cannot say for I cannot say for absolutely positive. All right. But the room looks like it's being filmed at the Boston Harvard Club. But it could be on campus and one of the buildings that I haven't been in are is very similar. But it's it looks so much like what you would see at the Boston Club, Harvard Club. So I, I could be wrong on the location, but it looks like it. Now, someone that you know might have been a Harvard um, student may have met, may have been in one of these buildings that, um, and they may recognize maybe the the carpet, but it sure looks like the Boston Club, Boston, the Harvard Boston Club. Right. You know, when I first knew something was up, um, I, I think I and most people definitely thought it would blow over though. So some dark machinery gets kicked into action when one of Roland's former staffers accuses him of sexual harassment. He was Roland Pryor's personal assistant, keeping his schedule and things like that. I got my hands on hundreds of pages of communication between Roland and this woman. The overwhelming impression he get is not sexual tyranny. It's like just straight up camaraderie. It is. Roland is talking to this woman about how much he wants to be a great dad and how he absolutely hates all the attention. Like occasionally mildly sexual. I mean, he jokes that if he were single, he'd need a better bed. And, you know, it's reciprocal. She tells him about the three unsolicited phone numbers she got on a recent work trip. I mean, she'd send him pictures of herself at a work party and reported that she was getting a little intoxicated. 2014, 2015. The relationship was getting sour. He had more and more complaints. His complaints were not always gracious. It was something like, my three-year-old could do this better than you did. Stuff like that. Eventually, Roland's office fires her. And they offer a severance package. And Harvard makes them cut it by $25,000. And Roland's lawyers have said, that if they'd just given her that extra $25,000, what's about to happen would have never happened. It was one of my closest friends. 
she left uh, on a very sour note. She wanted just plain old revenge. She goes and she logs 38 specific claims of sexual harassment. Instantly, investigators shave off six of those. And then after the investigation, they shave off another 26. All but six of them were rejected. Many of those on the ground that they were not only false, but they were deliberately false fabrications. In other words, they were lies. One of my closest friends deciding to spin complete lies. Was there anything true from the accusations she lodged? Yeah, but I'm saying like what? There, there were, there were. You have to understand the nature of this laboratory yeah. that we're only running. So this is the Ed Lab. It's right next to Harvard's campus. The walls are covered with his prized clientele. Like this spot was exceptionally informal. He would wear custom made sports jerseys. He play NBA jams and talk about research ideas. The informality has a intellectual purpose to ensure that he and everybody he works with are constantly willing to like hit and test these boundaries that are imposed upon you at Harvard. As part of that effort to cultivate a culture of norm breaking, he regularly played the most controversial black stand-up comedians. I mean, these are the master craftsmen of provocation. Why guys are so afraid of being a racist? I'm telling you. So the six things he's convicted of are the investigators finding this culture to have gone too far. So he once joked about how a senior administrator hadn't had sex since uh, black people were slaves. And he once said he learned his negotiating skills trying to get laid in high school. Think of the fondest memory of your friend. Both of you are laughing with a few other people, and she's throwing her head back, and she's laughing, and she, and being like, "You got that memory? Great, great. Now let us label it as sexual harassment." And I was like, "What?" The Harvard bureaucracy was looking around for somebody else to make a complaint. Complaining to her story, it began and ended in 2008. She's another ex-personal assistant, and she presents BlackBerry messages in which he is clearly flirtatious, like half joking that he's going to move to southern France and asking if she wants to come, or texting her from a fundraiser that if she were with him, he'd bite her. He was very flirtatious with her, probably more than he should have been. He was a subordinate, so that was a that was a bad decision. One thing Harvard investigator found was that Roland Farr never, never sexually propositioned or made sexual advances on a single woman in his office, not once. Uh, so that's it, Josh. That is it. Harvard's own investigators determined that Roland's punishment should be some training, some workplace sensitivity training. Okay. I feel like you're about to tell me something a little bit more. <laughs> he didn't just get training. They passed their recommendation to a small committee of high-ranking administrators. I was only able to figure out the identity of two members of that committee, okay? One of them is Claudine Gay. The other one is Larry Bobo. Yeah. Like champagne, silver spoon, liberals. Right, right. People whose careers and reputations were directly threatened by Roland's work. Those are the people that get to determine Roland's punishment. What happens next? Larry Bobo came in and he read out the punishment. It started with the lab is going to be permanently closed. And I was like, what? And then it goes on to all of the projects that you've been working on have been halted. And then it goes on to, you know. So they shut down his lab that was collecting the data that proves Claudine Gay and Bobo wrong. Oh, 
Mr. Holland's been suspended for two years, and I was like, this is this is the most cold-blooded murder I've ever seen. So why not just fire the guy? No, I have to. Right, tenure. Tenure. One of those quirky features of the academic job market, which means that he is guaranteed a job for life. So I, I, I found out Claudine Gay asked the president of the school to revoke Holland's tenure. President declines because that's not happened even once in the last hundred years. But this punishment is career death. You're just trying to say he's canceled. And destroyed his chances yeah, of getting a Nobel Prize. Cancellation. Right. Do you worry about that also though? Like even appearing in this? I think that there's a real risk, but I think um, what I've been thinking about a lot lately also is there's a risk to saying nothing at all and to look back on something and to realize that you should have said something, but you didn't just because you didn't have the words at the time. And maybe you have the words now, but the words aren't useful now. Like how could you be doing such important work, dedicating so much time and energy to helping people and have this be the, the end result? I, I think that was really disheartening. So, I mean, what happened to Rolling Fire? We know that it was not manslaughter. Like, it was murder. Like, it was intentional. And it was perpetrated by people who did not take kindly to his rigorous slaughter of their precious ideological codes. People who got gifted some superior weaponry and used it to snuff him out. It's ridiculous that... Uh, no. I'm sure that you won't hear anything like this on YouTube, but how is that any different than what the Democratic Party and the FBI and the CIA did to Trump? He was challenging their dogma of this socialized government, this increased national security state that wasn't accountable to anybody, the erosion of our constitutional freedoms, and they wanted to destroy someone that questioned their authority. They wanted to destroy Trump because he questioned their authority, that he was rocking the boat. Dr. Fryer, he was rocking the boat and proving CRT and DEI. Those constructs have serious flaws, theoretical flaws, and that his data suggest that structural racism isn't as prevalent as they're saying. Racism does exist, but it is not, not the controlling variables for these children to have a very successful and productive life. And by not listening to Dr. Fryer, more children and their futures will be destroyed. And the beauty of this is what he is saying not only helps black children, but it helps all children. He is the embodiment of exactly what MLK, Martin Luther King was saying, trying to help all people, no matter what their color is. So there is a, cons the ones that are in power will want to take down the ones that are questioning their power. Trump was is on the verge of being taken down by the establishment, by the swamp, by the deep state. And deep academia took down Rollin Breyer. that has to say this, but they're willing to enforce these ideological codes, even if it means sacrificing the future 
of those boys and those girls. Okay. When I first got to Harvard, people would say to me, hey man, how does it feel to beat the odds? And that would really piss me off because it's not about beating the odds. It's about changing the odds. So I guess I'm just trying to make the journey worth it, to be honest with you. So that is the inner, that, that's the documentary by Good Kid Productions. Now, I thought that was an excellent mini documentary and it gets you a better insight of the reason why there were so many people that were, why, why there was such a polarization with, with Claudine Gay and this whole DEI in the CRT. Because the bottom line is this, you have an economist, Dr. Fryer, that has the answer to solving the problem. And Claudine Gay, deep system, because he was questioning her authority and her perspective that there's structural racism and that the only way to stop that is to have affirmative action and DEI type policies. And it doesn't fix the problem. His solution does. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nano silver soaps that I have. I have five different varieties. This one happens to be charcoal tea tree, but I also have peppermint and others. So please go to the store and get a, this very high quality structural nano silver soap. I also have structural nano silver gel. This is important to neutralize pathogens. You put it on your hands, you put it around your mouth and around your nose, lightly coat your nostrils, around your ears, around your eyes. It'll stay active for five hours. In addition, you can use this as a skincare product. It'll help heal cuts, abrasions, and minor burns. And you can also use it on acne and you can apply it on your skin every night. And in the morning, uh, exfoliate and you'll start to notice your skin will improve. It's part of the skincare protocol if you've been paying attention. I also have structural nano silver lozenges. I have it in green apple and also in sweet menthol in a 20 count. I also have a hundred count for drops. The structural the structural nano silver drops and um, please Please go to that, go to the store and get the blueberry and the uh, honey and lemon drops. I partnered up with, I partnered up with Gail and Rainbow Herb Herbals. And we created these bars. She made them. She, you know, basically formulated them. But, uh, you know, we partnered up and we, brought this to the market, these deodorant bars. The, the, we have two different scents. Uh, one is uh, citrus and the other one is a peppermint tea tree. These are made from Himalayan essential oils, extremely high quality. So not only is this a deodorant bar, it will help to detoxify your body. So use this every day as a deodorant, but the, the added benefit is it'll help to detoxify detoxify your body. It does not have any aluminum in it. It's all natural. Go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get a couple bars of this deodorant. Very, very high quality. It's for males and females. Go to my store and also get lignans. It's a powder. You take it every day. It helps with your immune system. It's for males and females. It'll also help for hormonal balance. Magnesium and zinc, very important to take every day. Take one 
capsule a day. And if you're feeling sick, take two, two, you know, maybe one in the morning and one in the evening. But the point here is, is that you need to take this to help boost up your immune system. By boosting up your immune system, you're going to be able to fight pathogens. Your body's going to heal better and you're going to slow down the aging process. And, oh, by the way, a good immune system, a properly functioning immune system will help to fight cancer. So those are some of the products that I have on my store. I also have C60, which is a strong, strong antioxidant. I also have turmeric, which is a, it, which is used to bring down inflammation. I have ashwagandha to, to control your blood glucose levels and bring down inflammation. And Max 35, which is a, a structural nano silver liquid. You take a teaspoon out of a day, you swish it in your mouth, you gargle it, you swallow it. What happens is it's neutralizing the pathogens and um, that's part of the anti-aging protocol. I also have a structural nano silver toothpaste. It does not have any fluoride in it. It'll help to whiten your teeth, freshen your breath, reduce gingivitis, reduce the gum inflammation, and help with cardiovascular disease. It'll reduce the cardiovascular disease. And, and by having good oral hygiene, you're gonna reduce valvular disease. This is very important. Follow my advice, get the products that I offer on my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. That's the-studio-reykjavik.com. Link is in the description. Thank you for listening and pay attention. It's the eye candy was, oh, get the, the, the elite presidents that were female out. That's the eye candy. The real issue was, DEI and CRT is destroying the country. And they destroyed someone's career because he was proving them wrong with data. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.